Hello, hello, hello. This is Christy here from version of you 2.0. Thank you so much. Um, I hope you're jumping on so that you could be here today. I've got a really um, cool interview today. Now, to be honest, I think all of the interviews that I, I have for you are cool, but I got to tell you, um, she's also my best friend. Uh, she's almost like the opposite of me in a lot of ways, and yet our desire to help people um, is, I think, a, a really connecting force for us. Um, but anyway, my name is Christy. I'm here from Version of You 2.0, and like I said, I have a fantastic uh, interview with you today. It's all about non-attachment, and it really gets into uh, mindfulness. It gets into some concepts about impermanence and attachment and uh, how we can really strive towards our goals without feeling so disappointed in kind of missing out on the journey. And, and of course, I'm gonna let uh, Jen kind of take us through that, but I will be asking her a series of questions. And just before I do, I will go ahead and introduce her to you. So Jen has a lifelong passion for learning. Her journey into mindfulness began with her yoga teacher training, where she completed her 200 and 500 hour training. Her love of horses brought her to equine therapy and equine assisted learning, where she has her advanced level certifications and has two different certification and training modalities for her clients to experience. She continued to grow taking shamanic based energy healing and quantum shamanic Reiki as well as an advanced okay. mindfulness training with Eckhart Tolle and Kim Ng. Ng, yeah. Thank you. The beauty of all of this work that Jen loves so much is that they all complement one another, giving anyone who works with Jen a variety of options to explore in their work together. She's available to do private and group sessions in all of the above mentioned modalities. So Jen, thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks so much for inviting me. It's so fun. Uh, we'll definitely end up doing another one together. I can't believe out of all of the interviews that I've done that this is actually our first time doing one together. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to dive right in because this is really juicy stuff. Um, I think that for people like myself who are type A, I want you to really listen really closely and I want you to pay <laughs> even more attention to how your body feels. Okay. <laughs> so Jen. I want you to tell us what mindfulness and really why should we care about mindfulness? All right. Um, so I'm a, I'm a pretty practical person. So I don't, uh, mindfulness tends to be a word that gets, it gets passed around a lot and it gets to be, you know, it's, it's almost a buzzword. And when I get into those kind of buzzword things, I lose interest. I don't, I don't give a shit. I'll say I really don't. So what is mindfulness? To me, what is important is it creates a lot more peace in my life. Right. Um, it creates a lot more stability in my life. It helps me recenter and figure out what is actually important. Or when I'm stressing about something or worrying about something, if I'm able to connect to mindfulness even for a moment, then I can let go of some of that stuff because a lot of it's just creations in my mind that's causing a lot of anxiety or stress or unhappiness or whatever the case may be. So mindfulness really is becoming um, centered in the present moment. Okay. So in that moment where you just kind of take a breath and you look around and you notice in this moment, what's going on with you in this moment? And in this moment, like right now, in this moment, I'm sitting on my chair, I'm talking to you. My dog is squeaking a toy up at the top of the stairs. My other dog is pacing around, you know, looking to play. Um, and in this moment, that's what's going on. I'm not worried about anything else. I'm not thinking about the past. I'm not thinking about the present. I'm not stressing about anything. I'm just, I'm here with you. Interesting. So, okay. Yeah. So it's, it's a focus, but it's a level of focus that's different from kind of what I would be familiar with, with like my type A focus of really being, you know, stuck on a result. In this case, it's detaching yourself from that. And just, you know, if, if you're outside, you're kind of noticing birds that maybe you hadn't noticed before or whatever. 
Got it. Yeah, it's letting go of a laser focus and often our laser focus is goal oriented or driven. And it's not to say that you can't have goals and it's not to say that you can't have drive and it's not to say that you're checking out and you're not, you're not ambitious and trying for things, but it's from a different approach that it's not that approach of, and this is the equine therapy part coming up of the predator. It's not that goal driven, this is it. There's only one direction and it's straight ahead. It's more of a wide eyed view of right. the reality of the situation where you are. Mm -hmm. So how, why would I care? Like, why would mindfulness be important to me or to anybody else who's listening? Yeah. So honestly, mindfulness, why, why you would care is it, it's going to create a lot more, a lot more peace, a lot more ease in your life. Um, it's going to, you know, and this is, I'm coming to you not as any kind of expert because this is a lifelong journey. This is a work in progress. Um, but it give, it will give, it's beneficial for your physical health, for your emotional health, for your mental health, um, for your, your happiness, for your um, just even contentedness for kind of figuring out maybe even priorities in your life and, and really being able to be in, be in the world. So for example, I can give you an example of when we're not being mindful, like let's suppose, and I'm not saying that you, we're going to be mindful all day, every long, all the time. But it's more just being able to catch yourself when you are not being present and then help come back to present. And the more we can do that, um, the better that muscle grows. And the more we're able to see when we're in a place of reaction instead of taking action. So that's what I like, because that's more tangible for somebody like me, where it's almost like it, it's, it would be easier for me to know to pay attention to mindfulness when I'm being triggered, yep. when I'm ruminating thoughts, when I've brought attention to the fact that I'm not being mindful, you know what I mean? Where I'm, I'm, I'm angry and I'm just kind of letting it um, like get worse. I can't think of the word, it's almost mm -hmm. there. Um, so yeah, so in a situation like that, like let's suppose, I'll use an example. I get into a fight with somebody, let's suppose. We get, I, okay. I'm working customer service, I'm working front line. And somebody has been really unkind to me and been unfair and they just jumped all over me. So I can take a breath and just be a bit more observant about it and go, okay, this isn't about me. This is what's happening, but there's nothing more to that. And that would be being present. Where it's right. like, mm, this is what it is. Reacting. And so then I can take action from that. I can say, I can say, you know, I'm sorry, you can't treat me like that in a calm way. Yeah. I can choose to walk away. I can choose, but I'm choosing what my action is going to be. Right. Or I can get triggered and I can go off. So I can get all offended about it and then, and then fight in my head or re review this fight for the next 20 minutes as I'm driving home. Now I'm not paying attention to anything except for what happened. And what I could have said and what was said and how that happened and how it's unfair and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. None of this will do me any good. And in fact, it's actually harming me because going through all this story is going through all this. My nervous system's jacked up. It still thinks I'm fighting. It's still in fight flight. It's still ready to go. So I'm missing maybe some beautiful stuff on my drive home. I might be missing a sunset. I might be missing something that would bring me some joy. I'm reliving a fight that I'll never solve and I'm harming my nervous system. So I think what I like about that too, if I was to continue that storyline for a second with a lot of my clients, they're, um, you know, professional women coming home to a family. So if they end up accepting choice B, instead of choosing the mindfulness approach, they choose to ruminate and they choose to let it bother them. Now they're coming home to obligations in the family and they're likely not going to be able to give the best of them to the family because they've arguably spent so much time in this sympathetic response where they're just super stressed and wound. Yeah, absolutely. And then you add on top of that scenario, which, which I mean, we often do, I know I do this myself, is look at the things that I have to do. Yeah. And so then instead of going, hmm, so I'm driving home, I've got to go home, I've got to get dinner ready, then I've got to take the dog for a walk, then I've got to do that report, then I've got to call somebody, then I've got to do... So now I'm living in the future. 
And I'm yeah. thinking of all the stuff I've got to do, which again is stressing me out, which again is causing harm to my nervous system and my mental state and my emotional state. Now I'm just getting anxious thinking about, and a great deal of anxiety thinking about all things that I have to do. Right. Instead of kind of going, hmm, these are things I have to do one at a time. I'll do one thing. So when we live in the future, always thinking about what we've got to do, where we've got to go, how we've got to be, blah, blah, blah. It's hugely, hugely anxiety driven and it gets overwhelming. And then, you know, and then we're, again, we're missing, we're not living our lives. Right. Because we're, we're focused in the future. So often most of us are never right where we are. We're in the past or we're in the future. hundred mm-hmm. percent. So moving to the second question, because I think this will play in nicely. What is attachment and impermanence, and it's kind of a two-part question, and yeah. how does that cause us unhappiness? So what is attachment and impermanence, and then how does that cause us unhappiness? Okay, um, so attachment would be, and I remember when I first learned about this, I, I was attached to this notion, so I actually got really quite angry about it. Um, attachment is, is that you hang on to something, is that I'm attached to, this has to be the outcome. Or this has to be, um, you know, that you're holding on to something, you're holding on to a relationship, you're holding on to an outcome, um, you're holding on to even even life. And what I mean by that is, you know, I'll talk to people sometimes and they'll be like, if I die, you're going to die. You know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. sorry, but it's going to happen. Or, you know, with a, with a love or with a pet, oh my God, I don't know what I'll do if my animal dies. Well, I hate to tell you this, but he or she will, and it's gonna hurt. And it's a family member and it's, but it's part of, it's part of a big circle, it's part of life. Um, But the time you're spending worrying about that, you're missing time being present and enjoying the relationship you have. Um, And so everything, so our lives are impermanent. So this is where impermanence comes in too, is nothing is permanent. Right. Um, a beautiful sunset, an inhale, an exhale, life, um, the job, beauty, youth. Um, so the more we hold on to, you know, you want to look like you did when you're 16, when you're in your 50s. I'm looking at myself right now and not only am I getting regs and talking to you guys, but I'm like, oh, my God, I got a lot of wrinkles. I can I can that can haunt me, but it's going to get I'm going to get more wrinkly as I go. It's just how it's going to happen. Doesn't mean that I can't try to maintain the best version of me that I can, but I need to I need to be present with that version of me because that's where I am. I'm not. I need to let go of the attachment of being the 16 year old, right? With my looks or whatever. Does that make sense? Yeah. So where I see attachment mm-hmm. in, in, with my clients is with with their trauma. So where they have this emotional attachment to an experience that they had in the past, and that dictates all of the decisions they make about the future, right? Because we live in the the past or we live in the future and we're making Mm -hmm. decisions in the present moment. And then where I see impermanence with my clients is typically with their relationships, where they had this one relationship where it was either really good or really bad. And now every future relationship is based on that impermanence that, oh my God, that moment was so good. I need that moment in this next person a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's often a thing. Have you ever heard somebody say things are so good? I'm afraid. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm waiting for yeah. the other shoe to drop or something like that. Yeah. So in yeah. that moment, um, and the thing is, is that life is about ebb and flow. So you're going to have shit moments. Yeah. But instead of trying to Avoid it at all costs. Um, if you can ride through it and go, this is a tough one, breathe. You're going to be okay. You're going to get through this. Stay present and don't fight it so hard. You're going to come out too. Yeah. Just like you're going to have these beautiful moments, but if you're trying to hold on to them and you're scared to let them go, you're missing your beautiful moment and it will go. Like there's no, there's no sense of but. Nothing is meant to stay. So, um, and when we, when we hang on to, it has to be like this. This relationship has to be like the perfect one that I had, or the, or like you say, um, you know, when something really 
painful and we base all of our experiences will now be based on that. Um, it's, it's hard and that is a patterning, but if we're able to get really curious with ourselves and ask like, why? Why am I thinking this? Why am I saying that? Why am I reacting? What is that response? Why am I angry? Why am I sad? Asking yourself why a lot will help bring you to that kind of present moment and kind of like, what's going on? So you're watching yourself and you're asking yourself questions because, I mean, we're super interesting, complicated beings. Yeah. And, and you know, so I know that when I get pissed off and it happens, you know, we're all have this reaction. I'll be like, rah, rah, and I'll react. More often now with the practice, I can go, well, what's going on? Right. And then again, I have a choice because sometimes I'm just choosing to stay pissed off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair. And I'm going to have the biggest pity party or whatever. Then it's like, fill your boots. You know that you made that choice. Or I can go, okay, take a deep breath. Are you okay? Yeah. All right. Are you in danger? No. Are you, you know, and look at the things and look at the things that are going well or look around or take a deep breath and just come back and realize that the drama I'm creating in my head is not actually the drama in reality. Yeah, and that's so that's what we as a as a therapist and a and a coach, that's what we call moving from a foveal view to a, a peripheral view. And when you can move to that peripheral view, as you talked about earlier, mm-hmm. it's almost like common sense precedes you like like it you finally are like oh yeah no it's not as bad as Mm -hmm. the worst case scenario that I drawn out in my head yeah so I think that's where you know when we're attached to something or or where or where we have this impermanence to something that's what causes us this this unhappiness Mm -hmm. so how do we relate that to goals then um and striving to achieve them without this sense of attachment? Because I would think that that would be really difficult. Yeah, I mean, it really is. And I mean, it really, it, it takes a lot of inquiry. It takes a lot of kind of rejigging. And so I can give an example of something that I've done in my past where I've ruined something because I was so attached to trying to be a certain way. So I used to, this was a long time ago, but um, I was a ski instructor. And, you know, so I was proud that I was a ski instructor. That's great. I'm teaching kids. It's fun. And then instead of seeing this awesome opportunity, which was, guess what? You get to ski with better instructors than you. They're higher level and improve your skills for free. This is a huge, like, that's a cool thing. And I get to do it for free and I get to grow. But instead, I was so determined um, and attached to being really good and it was this mind's idea of what really good was which I don't think I would ever have achieved ever anyways in a million years because I think the bar would have continued you know with that whole kind of perfectionism piece yeah um that instead of enjoying the process of learning with them and having fun and you know just growing and gaining skills Instead, every everything I did was I didn't do that right. I didn't do that well enough. This wasn't good enough. And so even something that I really loved when I was doing it on my own time now was a criticism on everything that I was doing wrong. Right. Um, so so there was no enjoying the journey there. There was no enjoying. So my goal, let's suppose, was to be a much stronger instructor, maybe to go up a couple levels. Um and there's nothing wrong with that goal, but but without having that rigidity to it, like enjoy the process to get there and understand there's going to be some good days and there's going to be some bad days. And the thing is, is that ultimately we never know. Life is, there's nothing guaranteed in life. There's nothing permanent. I could do everything right. I could take every step to get to the goal that I'd set for myself. And something can still happen that that goal is unattainable. Um, so let's suppose that I got into, I don't know, like a, an accident and broke, 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 broke my legs and was unable to ever ski again. And then I can't attain that goal. But if everything is set towards that goal, like that is what has to happen. Um, then anything other than achieving it won't be good enough. Right. Um, And then the other thing is, is that once I do achieve it, is it actually a sweet, like I've just, if I just spent the last year 
trying to get there without paying any attention or any joy in, in all that I've done to grow, to get there, to learn, to play around with it, to all the growth and experience and opportunity if I don't appreciate any of that because I'm so single-mindedly focused on achieving that goal. If I do achieve it, is it going to be that good? Is it going to be what I thought it was going to be, this holy grail of things? And then what do you do after that anyway? So I think that's such a huge struggle Pers yeah. personally, professionally, uh, like, uh, do you have tips on how, like how we could do that, how we could still be driven and still want to be successful and still want to be these high performers, still want to yeah. project manage work and project manage home, yeah. but enjoy the journey. <laughs> so I think I would say there's a bunch of things. One is have that goal like yes it's really good to have goals and where we're living in, in human bodies and our experience is to you know part of our role is to experience and learn and grow and 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 you know and achieve and have goals and that but to maybe have a looser goal so let's suppose you know i would like to get higher education does it have to be a PhD in this absolutely specific, this is the only stream that will be what I can do? Or can you have a, a goal that can be a little changing and a little moving? So that you know you're you're growing, you're learning, you're growing, but if maybe, maybe, because then you're giving yourself room as well. And maybe this isn't necessarily where I want to go. Maybe I want to veer left, maybe I want to veer right. There's room. For negotiation, there's room for reflection and change, and that way too. If you know, if that goal doesn't be attained, you're able to kind of go, yeah. But I've had a lot of a lot of growth and a lot of things along the way. Um, is rem and so what I would say is reminding yourself often. The more we can practice mindfulness, the more we can pr practice being present, the more it becomes available to you. So that's kind of this daily thing. Like um, before you start your car, can you? And, and I would say change these, change these on a regular basis, so it doesn't become part of a routine. But can you? Let's suppose because often what we do is we hop in our car, oh, I gotta get to work, and then I gotta, I gotta, 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 and we start that like daily crazy, going hard, going fast, um, living in the future, all the things that you have to chase. Um, so before you start your car in the morning, can you take? four breaths right can you look around can you feel in your body and notice what's going on it's just um, a pause. that's that's all you're talking about it's just pause okay. please okay just a pause and a reset okay and a reset yep and a reset okay. so it's not all about and if you know you don't have 30 seconds to do that mm. <laughs> yeah. life sucks <laughs> <It's you. laughs> life's gonna be pretty bad yeah yeah um, and then to do that throughout, like as many times as you can. So, you know, meditating or finding stillness is really good. Don't get me wrong. And there is a place for that. And if you can do that, if you can incorporate 10, 15 minutes in your, in your day or half an hour, whatever time you have um, to do that, absolutely. But if you were to pick one thing, being quiet alone in a quiet room doesn't translate in life as well as being able to go, oh, wow. Well, I'm freaking out what is going on take a deep breath look around um and also i would say one of the really big things with that with those mindfulness pieces is nature really helps you yeah. become grounded because nature is there's it's it it has the impermanence like the sun won't stay up all day nor will the moon you're not going to have this you know all your seasons change all the you know so there's, it is mindfulness, it is presence in perfection. And so the more time we can spend in nature and observing nature and spending time, it grounds us and it teaches us. So I would say, you know, spending time with animals in nature is huge for that. Um, and then I would say one of the bigger, bigger pieces is gratitude. Right. And people talk about that. And sometimes that becomes, in our society, everything has to be big. You know, like to say, what are you grateful for? I better come up with something big. You know what I mean? And that's why I love doing the gratitude journal because, or, or for myself, I'll do a little journal. 
and it's it's a little goal to say like how much can I find to be grateful for today and I'm not looking for and so if somebody were to ask me at the end of the day if I don't do a journal what are you grateful for I might be able to come up with some things but I want something gratitude worthy in my opinion that will be interesting to you but this is what that's about because right it's about is you know what I was grateful that my shower felt really good this morning I was grateful for the bar so it smells awesome like I got a new soap I really like it I was grateful for so it's all tiny little things there's nothing earth shattering nothing to write home about or put on social media nobody cares but those are all things that made my day that much richer and that much better and that much more joyful and there's more peace in my life so that's the kind of stuff that will help along the way as well, is when you can really appreciate the simple, beautiful things that are happening all around all the time, especially when things are hard. Yeah, and that it's accumulative. Like, you know, the shower was one component of your day, you know what I mean? So then there's going to be other components of your day where you're going to stop and be mindful, kind of, and and then remember those as part of your your gratitude journaling later. Oh, I saw this beautiful translucent butterfly or whatever the case may be. And so what I try to do is I actually try to carry it, like to have it like a little note pad or something with me. Okay. So that it's not a report at the end of the day. So I'm actively throughout the day going, pay, trying to pay attention, which keeps me much more present. So that way it's like, oh, I love that blue jay. You know, I'm walking the dogs, I'm thinking about work and blah, 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 and all of a sudden a blue jay catches my attention. And, uh, sorry, my husband's banging on the window. <laughs> a blue jay will catch my attention, let's suppose, and I like that, so I'll make a note to write that down, because at the end of the day, I might forget that. But it was one of 70 cool little things that happened throughout the day. I like that. Yeah. So, um... Are there any other ways to become more present that you can think of? Like any other top tips that we haven't discussed already? Um, well, a lot I would recommend to you really connecting in with your body. Yes. Your body is, uh, it never lies. So number one, our heads lie all the time. Um, you know, our egos try to understand things. Are, so our bodies are the 100% truth tellers. So start getting used to asking your body questions too. If you feel anxiety, if you feel that gut thing in your tummy or whatever, breathe into that and ask yourself a question. What is it telling you? What do you need to know? Is there a message there for you? And try not to control a response. Just allow whatever comes up to be, to be information for you. And it's not good or bad. Just let it be. It's information. Yeah. Um, so getting really used to connecting in with your body and listening to your body. So taking time to really, to, to feel into your body, to notice. Um, gratitude would be another one. Um, realistic goal setting too, like looking back at what, where, you, where you've come. So if you've got these goals and you're, you're, you know, you're wanting you know, an end result, let's say you want to get your master's, um, take time to appreciate where you've been. What did it take to get you there so that you don't get so single-minded focused that you forget to look at how far you've come all the way along? And that way, if you don't achieve it, you can still appreciate how far you've come. If you do achieve it, you can appreciate what you did to get there. Um, like that. Um, when my clients uh, come to sessions and they're kind of newer to me, my first question to them is, what's going well? And they're all, they're always so prepared to start bitching. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like start like venting their frustrations. And when I say, so what's going well? Like, and again, they get used to that pretty quickly, but in the first session, they're like, hold on, I got to pause, please. I got to actually think about that. Cause I spent hours pissed off and I can tell you all the bad things and all the things that I don't want, but I really don't know what went well today. Yeah. I, yeah. like, I like that a lot. Yeah. And um, I would say one piece is one piece is a little bit of faith too, the, the mindfulness thing. And, and I mean, and it's hard. I'm not going to say it's not because I struggle with this a lot is the idea of wanting something and then wanting to try to control it because I have a picture of how it's going to look and what it is that I want. Oh, yeah. you talk directly to me. Uh, mm, 
Yeah, it's rough, man. It's so hard. And then it's hard when things don't go the way I'm trying to control it. Then I'm pissed off or I'm trying to control it further or harder or, you know, trying to make that thing happen. Um, you know, I grew up always with that lesson in my head that if I worked hard yeah. um, and it wasn't getting something, work harder and work yeah. harder, work harder. And ultimately you could get what you want, but it was a matter of working harder. But that's not the reality. That's not true. We don't have control. And so what I'm starting to get better at is one is learning in my body when I feel that mm, feeling. That's an indication that I absolutely shouldn't do what I think I need to do immediately. Okay. So that feeling of like, oh my God, I have to do this right, 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 right now. That's usually anxiety speaking. That's usually trying to control something. And that's usually the wrong answer. And so, yeah, and it's the S word, it's surrendering. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that often we don't know where we're going to wind up. We can have a picture, but it may not look like. And the thing is, is that we're kind of programmed to expect, oh, God, I hope it's not this, 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 instead of like, you know, what could it be? Like, if, for example, if I say you're getting new neighbors, oh, I hope they're not assholes. You know, well, that's no. exciting. It's great. You know, I, I'm so excited. You know, we we worry about the problems or what what could go wrong as opposed to what could go right. And so it is a matter of that. This is what I want to achieve. Take the steps you can do to achieve understanding that you may not have any control of it, but have the faith or the trust that the steps that you're taking will lead to somewhere good whether it's what you're picturing in your head or not, it may be better than what you're actually picturing. It may be something that you haven't even envisioned. Um, we did that we don't know. So you can control your actions and your steps, but your outcome, we really don't know. And we really don't have control over that. We have to release, mm -hmm. release our expectations. We have to surrender to the fact that we don't have control. We have to understand and lean into fear, knowing that fear is literally the fear of the unknown, the fear of not being able to control something. Uh, and we basically have to breathe, find beauty in the moment that we're in, uh, potentially journal, um, and really pay attention to the body when we feel those physiological responses that, you know, are kind of attached to fighting something. And instead, kind of just giving ourselves that pause moment. That's amazing. And the more pause moments you can give, the more you're going to undo the stories or the stuff that's going on. So it gives you little moments of peace all throughout the day. And the better you get at that, the better you can, um, you can give yourself those little breaks or to re, re change your pattern in your head. And it may only last for 10 seconds. But, you know, it may not last long but it gave you a, a few moments and it also gives you opportunity instead of acting to react, to make the choices as opposed to just be on autopilot response. Right. So lots of, lots of reasons to practice it. Um, and it's not easy. <laughs> it's no, not I, know. I know. I know. I'm always like, Hey, I gotta, I gotta focus on my chi. Excuse me. So I'm even trying to control my moment. To, to, to surrender. I'm like, got to focus on my chi. <laughs> so yeah. I appreciate all of this. Well, thank you very much, Jen, for being here with me. Uh, definitely, uh, we can talk um, outside of this um, to see about you coming back for sure. For those of you who are paying attention now or going to watch the replay letter, please, later, please comment. Um, let us know if you've got any questions. I will tag Jen so that she's um, available to you if you've got particular questions for her. Um, and if you've got some subjects that you're interested in her sharing based on her expertise, I'll bring her back. So just let us know what more you want. And until that time, until uh, I see you next, goodbye. Thank you, Jen. Thank you for having me. It was really nice. Here's the show not for you, everybody. Have yourself a great rest of your evening. Bye.